Okay, we're about to begin a new chapter. Chapter five of the chapter Sota. Before we do, I'm gonna share something Rabbi Gimple emailed me in connection to what we were discussing yesterday. So yesterday uh, we were discussing here why a couple, whether husband or wife, have some sort of a physical impairment, a blind, lame, deaf, mute, then the cycle law is, doesn't apply. So we first learned the Gemara, which told us the verses from which this is derived, uh, the various description of the narrative of the cycle law. And then we offered uh, some explanation as to why might Hashem do that. And um, we suggested, I think between uh, Yeshua and I, we suggested that they have to be on equal footing, have a perfect union before they can put through such a ringer like the Sarita law. And added to that, like, you know, they're dealing with so much already blindness of this or that, to put them through the law. So, Big Gimbal added that a very similar thing is you find with the law of the rebellious son, right? That if the father or mother also lack any physical way, they're lacking physical, some sort of physical impairment, they also, the, the, um, the rebellious son law is called off. And likewise, we also have the comparison earlier between the rebellious child and the soita, and that the husband can take back the warning, just like in the, just like in the rebellious parent, uh, child, the parents can take back the, they can drop the charges, right? So similarly, putting it all together, maybe it will suggest that Hashem, uh, is Torah is emphasizing that when there's a troubled family, you're much better off with reconciliation, some sort of therapy, rather than go through the harsh laws of either the rebellious child or the soita law especially when they are dealing with their own physical impairment. So I thought that was nice. So I'm sharing that. I also was thinking of the following. Getting back to what we talked about way at the beginning of the cycle law, which is that our relationship with Hashem is compared to marriage. And infidelity, which is what the cycle law is about, question, a question of a woman maybe being unfaithful, is compared to a Jew, who's the wife in the relationship between God and us. Our suspected infidelity. We stray. We're not always faithful. Or we get into compromised situations where maybe our faithfulness is being tested. And uh, there's the blessing of the curse there if you overcome or not, like the site of law. So I, I haven't thought this all the way through. I'm just kind of sharing my thoughts as they are come as I thought of them. So in our relationship with Hashem, if we were created in such a way that we are spiritually blind, deaf, mute, lame, meaning Hashem made us in such a way where we are lacking in our ability to see clearly and to, to, to overcome certain challenges, and the sight of the law is called off. As if to say, Hashem is saying, look, I understand, I put you in a position where you're not capable of seeing certain things. I put you in a position where you're incapable of going certain places, metaphorically speaking. And I, I can't hold you accountable. I can't drag you to into the site of law. Perhaps. Follow what I'm suggesting? Oh, yeah, but it would require a third party. What do you mean a third party? Because oh, the third party is our... is is are lusting and desiring things that are ungodly. That's the unfaithfulness, right? No, no, a third party in, in, in the sense that when you're brought Excuse to the Sanhedrin, right. you're being judged by a third party. Oh, in that sense. Yeah, okay. No, no, the, yeah, so the comparison still stands in the terms of like... So now you're, you're making a show where two different hats. A show where all the hats, right? No, you're right, I hear you. I hear so, you. I hear you. The only thing I'm trying to figure out, the, the part of the puzzle that I'm missing here is what does it mean when, so to speak, God is blind, right? Because the husband also, if the husband's blind, lame, or 
So what does it mean for God? Maybe if God hides himself from us, what he makes is if he's blind, so to speak, like we describe in the story of the of Purim, where God treated us as if he was sleeping because we were sleeping. Right? We were sleeping in terms of our service of God. So God was sleeping in response, so to speak, and you know, not treating us with the alert. Turn a blind eye. Turn a blind eye, as the expression goes, yeah. yeah. So maybe that's also part of the element. If Hashem says, look, I hid myself from you. I didn't make myself available. I turned myself away from you. And I can't hold you accountable for what, for mistakes that may or may not have happened. Perhaps this is what's happening. And I'm just basing on the Pesach, which is, Noida Lila Ben Eldam, from this Pesach, Noida Lila Ben Eldam. Woe is to the scheming that happens upon man. It's to say that God sets up a person many times where, you know, it's almost at the end of the day, Hashem almost factors into the equation that we're going to fail at certain points considering how he made us and the world he put us in. You know, so made, us, made us spiritually lacking, right. blind, blame, mute, and so on. Because he's constantly setting us up, so we're, we have to be constantly asking, what's his, what's his, what's the plan? What's the plan? Yeah, what's, what's, the, what's his yeah. objective? Anyway, this is just like, a, these are kind of uh, ruminations that I've been thinking about, so I'm putting them out on the floor, on the table, and um, so pick up the pieces, said, agree, disagree. What you just said before about what you were sleeping, and so... Yeah. It, it, it brings me to think about the Bolshevik teaching that we mirror each other. That's right. It's based on that teaching, actually. It's based on that. Hashem okay. God, uh, the verse says that God is your shadow. So the Bolshevik says, it's just like a shadow follows the, the behavior, the patterns of the one who's creating the shadow. Let's say I'm walking, so the shadow moves with me. So so is with Hashem. Hashem responds to us the way in which. Respond they respond to him, or, or which respond is built on the, around us. Right, which is built on the Gemara. That's me the connected me the God's measure for measure. But measure for measure in the classic sense means like retribution. You behave a certain way, and God responds in kind. This is almost this is a little deeper than that in the sense that uh, the the flow of divine energy that we uh, intake is created by the manner in which we conduct ourselves. So if we're in a happy state, then we draw upon divine happiness. If we're in a state of the opposite, we draw upon divine opposite. Right? So if Jews are in a state of sleep, we draw upon ourselves a divine state of sleep. Right? So that's, that's perhaps like the, the blind lane mirroring from husband to wife. And either way, the like the law is called off because I mean, the guy's in a circumstance where he can't handle these kinds of tests and things, so can't hold them accountable. Perhaps again, floor's open. Right. Yeah. There's, there's a lot in this thing. Okay, so this is just, just some comments on yesterday's class. And now we move on to our new chapter, chapter five, 27 B Chavzanam base. What was that? Oh, so it was book. Yeah, it's fine. So the, the track date, as we pointed out a number of times, follows the narrative of the circle law. Right. So we began way at the beginning with the warning, describing what the warning is and how it has to be done. The seclusion, witnesses, no witnesses, and all the rest of that. Her being taken to the local court, her being taken to the temple, the proceeding in the temple, the offering, the erasing of God's name, the water, the earth, every detail has been described as we went on. The last thing we discussed is who are the people which qualify as husband and wife to be Saita, who is the person about whom she's being warned to qualify as Saita. And now we get to the effects of the water, which is the next step. So she drank the water, now what's the effect? That comes, that, that's what comes now. Like we're following the narrative of how the, like the law plays out. So it begins like this. Just as the water investigates and tells us about her behavior, so kach so too, hamayim the water boitkin oisoi investigate and inform us about him. 
him being the person about which she was warned. Lamar is going to discuss how it serves as a, you know, she drinks the water, but the negative effect happens to him as well. I, I learned an English word when I read Rabbi Steinsaltz, paramour. Yeah. That's the word he uses there, paramour. Oh, he's yeah. the person about who she's having the suspected relationship. Okay. So Shinemar, as the verse reads, Ubo, Ubo. Uh, the Gemara is going to discuss exactly how we derive from these words um, this teaching. But essentially, we'll keep it simple. The Torah says twice, Ubo amai mamarim. The, word, the, the verse says twice that the waters will go into her. So twice to teach us that the water going into her has a double effect on her and on the paramour. He uses the fancy word since we know it. Right? Yeah, the words you know, have different ways of learning this, but we'll stick to this version. Okay, so next teaching in the Mishnah, that's teaching number one that the effect of the water is on her and on the paramour. Considering the verse's double expression, bo, bo, the water shall enter her twice. Teaching number two is now. Another result of the drinking of the water is a law we've discussed a number of times, but every time we discussed it, we were quoting the Mishnah here, which reads, Kishem Shasura Labal, just as she now becomes forbidden to her husband, right, because of the suspected infidelity. So Kach so too, Asura Labayo, she's forbidden to, at any later time, marry the paramour. She's forbidden to be with her husband and with the paramour. Shinemar's the verse reads, Mitma vinitma. The verse reads, uh, again, the Gemara is going to go through all the various different uh, verses in more detail. And when we do that, we're going to pull up the text of the, of the verses so we can see it. But now we're just sticking to the Mishnah in, its, in a simple, in the simplest kind of form. So the verse says, Nitma vinitma. When the verse, at one, at one point, the verse describes that she becomes defiled. And at that point, the verse says, and she becomes defiled, adding the word and represented in the letter vav at the beginning of the word. The prefix vav at the beginning of the word means and. So that word and, that letter vav, teaches us that there is a extra defilement. <clears throat> Namely, not only is she now defiled and therefore cannot be with her husband, but there's an additional defilement. She cannot be with the paramour. Give it Rabbi Kiva. This is the words of Rabbi Kiva. Omer Rabbi Yeshua. Rabbi Yeshua says, Simil, In a similar way, uh, Rabbi Yeshua is telling us that there was a Jew named Zechariah, son of Katsav. So either Katsav is a name or Katsav means a butcher, as in the son of the butcher. Either way, Zechariah, son of Katsav, Ben HaKatsav, would derive the verse the same way. Because there's an extra vav, and she's defiled. It indicates an extra layer of defilement. The not just she can no longer be with her husband, but she can no longer be with the paramour either. Is this prior to drinking? It would be prior to drinking, yeah. Good point, because the Gemara puts it out of order, but it would be prior to drinking. Is that what he says there? Yeah. It would be prior to drinking. It's a good point, because it's... Yeah. Yeah. It would be prior to drinking, yeah. Yes, it would, it, you're right. I should put that's right. We discussed that before because once she drinks the water and she comes out innocent, then she can go back home. There's no problem. We made peace between husband and wife, and she can be with her husband, right? Because she can, she's been vindicated. So obviously, this is talking about before she drinks the water, which makes the narrative a little out of order because we just described the effect of the drinking and now we're going back, right? Which is interesting. Good point. Yes, thank you for pointing that out. Okay, so one way of deriving this notion that she can no longer be with her husband and also no longer be with the paramour before she drinks the water, or if for whatever reason she doesn't drink the water because she backed out or he backed out for whatever reason. So one way of deriving that is from the extra letter vav, the extra word and, attached to the word, she becomes defiled. Rabbi Omer, Rabbi says, another way of deriving at this conclusion is, Shnei the parsha nitma'ah ben nitma'ah. 
because twice the verse says she becomes defiled. So as opposed to Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Zechariah, who looked at one time the verse said nitma, she's defiled, and derived it from the fact that the verse adds above an and, Rabbi looks at the fact that the two different times when the verse says she's defiled. Again, the Gemara is going to go through the details of the verses, and each time the word nitma, she's defiled, comes up, and what it teaches us, and what exactly is the point of the argument between Rabbi and Rabbi Akiva. The Gemara is going to get to that, and when we do, we will look at all the verses and we'll see it more clearly, but let's just learn the Mishnah as it is for now. And again, this tells us, Echad Nabal, one time, in Rabbi's view, one time the verse said, she is defiled to tell us she can no longer be with her husband. The Echad Labayl, and one time that it says she's defiled, is to tell us that she can no longer be with the paramour either. Okay, so two different ways of de deriving at the same law. And essentially, we have two laws of the Saita. But the rest of the Mishnah is not going to be outside the law at all. It's going to be completely unrelated. Be somewhat un unrelated, and most of the Gemara is going to be dedicated to discussing the later points that are unrelated from the Saita. The Agadic parts. Well, some are Lachic, some are Agadic, as we'll see. But so we have two laws of the Saita, and they are number one, the effect of the water is on her and the paramour, number one. Number two, before drinking the water, while she's still under suspicion, she is forbidden to be with her husband. She's also forbidden to be with the paramour. If they were to divorce, she couldn't marry him. The Gemara, the mission here told us the verses we should be looking at to derive these two laws. And the Gemara is going to get into the details of those verses and uh, give us a sharper view. It's exactly how we should understand each word of the verse. And again, when we get there, I will pull up the text of the, of the verses so we can see that more clearly. Okay. So Rashi tells us, considering what's about to follow the Mishnah, that this discussion about uh, this discussion about her becoming forbidden to her husband and as well as becoming forbidden to the paramour that she's defiled doubly, Rashi tells us this discussion happened on a famous, or I don't want to say infamous, but a famous day in the Talmud. The Gemara describes elsewhere, in Baruchis, I think we once had occasion here to learn this story many years ago. The day Rabbi Gamliel was deposed. Rabbi Gamliel was the leader of the Jewish people, Nasi. And um, he was a very strong leader with very, with very little compromise, room for compromise. And this had two effects. Number one, the study hall was scarce because he only allowed people in who are, quote, their inside matches their outside. Only 100% pure, honest people. If externally they expressed uh, or espoused scholarship, espoused piety, but their inside didn't match up, they weren't allowed into the study hall. This is 100% purity. That's it. So not a lot of people in a study hall. It also led to a schism between him and Rabbi Yeshua, which resulted in the sages getting together and deposing Rabbi Gamliel. And the sages sat down to depose Rabbi Gamliel. They need to install someone else in his place. I'm telling you the whole story because we're going to see all the players here are going to come up in our Gemara here. So the sages are discussing who to, who to put in Rabbi Gamliel's place. So their initial thought was, let's put Rabbi Yeshua. But they figured that would look, the, the, the optics are no good. They deposed Rabbi Gamliel because he had a schism with Rabbi Yeshua and they put Rabbi Yeshua in. It looks self-serving a little bit. So, okay, we can't put Rabbi Yeshua in. The optics are bad. Then they decide maybe we'll put Rabbi Kiva in. The greatest leading scholars. But they decided against that because Rabbi Akiva um, didn't have uh, lineage like some of the other sages. And they felt that uh, some of the members of the community wouldn't, uh, wouldn't have that kind of, wouldn't look up to him, wouldn't, wouldn't have defense of his history. Okay. So they settled on Rabbi Eliezer ben Azariah. Rabbi Eliezer ben Azariah. And Rabbi Eliezer ben Azariah at the time was a very young man. Exactly how old he was is a good question. He was a young man. And overnight, he grows some white hairs, so he looks distinguished and elder. And that's 
the famous line in the Haggadah, wherever Lezab and Azariah says, it's like I'm 70 years old. He's not 70 years old, much younger. Once Rabbi Lezab and Azariah is uh, installed, so the, the, the strictness of Rabbi Gamliel has been lifted. So there's no longer that tight grip on this absolute purity of who's allowed into the study hall. It opens the floodgates and everyone wants to come in to democratize information in modern terms. Now that everybody's in the study hall, many more ideas are coming forward, many more thoughts, many more arguments, many more discussions. And therefore, the Gemara tells us that on that day, there were so many intense discussions that there was no halacha unresolved. So very often, or often, you'll find throughout the Mishnah, where the verse said, where the Mishnah says, boy, 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 on that day, X, Y, Z was taught. And that day is referring to this day when Abelazim and Azariah was installed to replace Rabbi Gamaliel. Because that day, the door is open for all scholarship, so everybody can share their views and opinions. And like in this way, they've come to lots of resolutions. So this discussion about deriving from the word, nitma of anitma, deriving from the verse, describing her defilement to tell us that she's both forbidden to her husband to cite the woman before she drinks the water. And she's forbidden to the paramour. That was derived on that day. And therefore, the Mishnah is now going to list a bunch of other things that were derived on that day. So it's a tangent in which we're going to discuss laws, laws and agada that isn't related to Saita, but simply because of the day that this happened. And we find this throughout Talmud quite a bit. Bye bye yoyim. On that day, on this day, Rebbe Menazari was installed. So I told you all the names um, because it's going to be interesting that Rebbe Akiva, who was suggested to be installed, but wasn't actually installed, is going to do most of the talking. So it's not Rebbe Menazariah, the leader who was installed, but actually Rebbe Akiva, who was a candidate to be installed, he's going to be doing, doing a lot of the talking, as well as we're going to hear from Rebbe Yeshua, the person that had the schism with Rebbe Gamaliel, which was the cause of Rebbe Gamaliel be, uh, being deposed. So these are the players that are going to be discussed here. So let's begin at least the first law. Bye bye yoim on that day. Daughter Shabi Akiva, Shabi Akiva expounded and explained the following verse. The verse says, "The klicheres asher yipul mehem el toichay, kol asher b'toichay yitma." The earthen were vessel. Um, which something impure will fall inside of it. Everything that's in it will become impure. What this is talking about is, the verse is talking about the laws of ritual impurity. The law of the earthen word vessel is very unique. It's, a, it's the, the, the laws of, of purity and impurity, Toma and Taga, are perhaps the most complex in all of Torah. Because there's exceptions to every single rule and exceptions to exceptions. And then there are rabbinic enactments that go on top of it. And then you treat rabbinic enactments different than biblical enactments. And it, it, it's a very, very complex set of laws. So one of the exceptions is the law of the klicheres, the law of the earthenware vessel, which is treated different than other earthenware vessels. In that the way an earthenware vessel contracts impurity is not by contact, but by impurity entering the ear space of that vessel. So say a uh, sheretz, one of the seven defiling creepy crawlies, known as a sheretz, enters the ear space of an earthenware vessel. The earthenware vessel is now impure. Now, what happens if inside the earthenware vessel there was bread? So it says the verse that because the earthenware vessel is itself impure by the airspace, but it's now in contact with the bread that's in it, so now the bread becomes impure. That's the verse says here. A an earthenware vessel into which there falls something that's impure. Anything else that's in the vessel, yitma becomes impure by virtue of the fact that it's in contact with the earthenware vessel. This is the verse. So explain to Abiyakiv on that day. It doesn't say it's impure. It shall be impure. Turning it from a description into a, what's the word? Into an action. So the simple reading would be that it has become impure. And that's the description of the action. But Rabbi Akiva says, 
if that's if all you're trying to describe is that it became impure, then just state the fact it's impure. Don't describe it as an action. Therefore, it says Rekiva, Matame Achedin. It's telling us that it itself, besides for being impure, becomes an actionable thing that can make other things impure. Which means the impure item comes into this airspace of the earthenware vessel. The earthenware vessel is now impure. It comes in contact with the bread, as the verse just said. It, the bread inside the vessel becomes impure because it's in contact with an impure vessel. Now Rabbi Kiva is adding that because the verse says in describing that bread is becoming impure as an action, not just a result, that teaches us that the bread becomes active impurity too. And if this bread were to touch something else, that would become impure. Following? That's what we keep is deriving from this word in describing the bread becoming impure as opposed to describing it as a result, which you could have just said tummy. It describes it as an action, yitma, to teach us that it itself becomes an activated impurity to confer impurity on something else. It can impart impurity. It can impart impurity, yeah. What do you say? This is talking about a specific kind of vessel, not any kind of vessel. Earthenware vessel. Well, but it has to be shaped in like a, like, no. like, yeah, because that type of vessel, there's no air that moves with inside. Nothing to do. If it comes in the airspace, it's fine. Even if it's an open pot it with no to top. So, so there are certain impurities that come with uh, airspace where there's a covering, too much oil. It's a different kind of impurity. It's a unique law of the earthenware vessel, even if the top is completely open. The fact that something enters airspace makes the vessel impure. And if it didn't touch it, and even if there's no covering. It's a unique law of the earthenware vessel. Right, because that particular kind of vessel, there's no air that moves. Nothing to do with that. Even if it's completely open at the top, even if it's shaped like a V, doesn't matter. It's a unique law of the Usually you're right, but not in the earthenware vessel. It's a unique exception to this rule. Okay. It's a unique exception for the earthenware vessel. I, I'll tell you, the laws of impurity are very, very strange. I should say strange, God forbid, but they're very, very um, peculiar and, 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 and detailed and all kinds of exceptions to every rule. It's very, very difficult to, so there to truly was a master question it. question on Shabbos. Somebody was asking that they, they didn't want to drink the, the, the mashka because they're saying it's not kosher because they read the label in the back and it's like, in one kind of cast. That's something completely unrelated. They're talking about uh, the laws of kosher. This is the laws of ritual impurity, which have no relevance today. Yeah. The only issue of ritual impurity is a question of being able to enter the temple or being able to eat sacrificial food, which you don't have today. So it, it, these laws are almost irrelevant today. Okay. So what, what that person is talking about is the issue of kosher, which we can talk about maybe another time. Exactly what the person was saying. A little bit of controversy a couple of years ago about the different types of barrels used for aging. Right, but the whole thing that the... I'll, I'll explain that another time, but that's not the question of impurity. Okay, so says Rabbi Akiva, Limaid, this teaches us, I'll keep our shame on a, let's see, a loaf of bread that is a second rate impurity because it's degree, right? So there's degrees. You have the object that's impure, that's say that creeper crawly, that's the primary. And then you have the av. And you have the Rishon, the number one level of impurity, the vessel that, that it, into which it enters the airspace, level one. Degree number two is this vessel which touched the bread. And then now it's teaching us that level two can be mitama shlishi, can now confer impurity onto a third degree. So here, Rabbi Kiva found, doesn't impart, no, biblically, rabbinically, whether it's for truma, whether it's for uh, non truma food, whether it's for the sake of eating turma, for the sake of entering the temple, all kinds of yeah, thousands, all kinds of exceptions, which we're going to leave for now. We're just going to keep it as basic as possible. The point being that Rekiva found a verse that indicates to us that a level two impurity can do, or a second degree impurity can confer impurity into a level three. A way to imagine it to give us a little bit of, um, you know, a, a current, uh, modern way of understanding this is to envision it is like to, sorry? Um, yeah, is to use is to use an example of um, like virology. Like certain types of viruses travel through contact, some travel through food, some travel through air, some all kinds of different viruses that travel different ways depending on the materials that are being used. And sometimes, uh, as the virus travels from one host to another, it gets weaker and weaker. Other times, it gets stronger and stronger. It's the issue of the laws of impurity, the spiritual mechanism of ritual impurity travels in all kinds of uh, interesting patterns, depending on what kind of impurity, at what degree, 
what's the vessel, that, what's the carrier, is it earthenware, is it food, is it water? So imagining it that way could kind of give us a sense of like, you could think of it as spiritual virology, you know, <laughs> like impurity starts at a certain point and then it travels through various different means. But anyway, yeah. Okay, so now we have an interesting little uh, line that comes up here and we'll conclude with that. Amr Rabbi Shur, Rabbi Shur said, Mi yigala afar meinecha Rabbi Yechem ben Zakkai. Who is going to remove the earth from your eyes? Rabbi Yechem ben Zakkai. Rabbi Yechem ben Zakkai already passed away. Rabbi Yechem ben Zakkai is the famous person who um, negotiated with Vespasian to keep the yeshiva alive. Vespasian, the Roman ruler who destroyed the temple. Rabbi Yechem ben Zakkai had a meeting with him. And one of the things he negotiated for was to keep the study hall of Yavna alive, and that would preserve Torah for future generations. And it was his students that became the primary um, teachers of the Mishnah, Rabbi Yechem and Zakkai's students. His students are the people we're talking about here, Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Yeshua. These are the students we're talking about, these are Rabbi Yechem and Zakkai's students. So Rabbi Yeshua, who is Rabbi Akiva's colleague, who hears his teaching from Rabbi Akiva on that day when Rabbi Gamaliel was deposed, and thus the floodgates of scholarship opened. Rabbi Kiva shared his teaching. So Rabbi Shua says, ah, who would remove the earth from your eyes, our dear teacher, Rabbi Yechel Medzaka, as he had passed already. If only you were to see, to be here, to, to witness what you just heard from Rabbi Kiva. Why is that? Shayisa Oimra, because you, Rabbi Yechel Medzaka, used to say, Asidoy Acher, there's got to come a generation. The tired Kikar Shlishi to say that a third degree impurity is totally pure, is no problem. Why? Because we have no verse in scripture that tells us it's impure. Rabbi Yechon ben Zakkai taught his students that third degree impure impurity is indeed a problem. It's impure for whatever level, which maybe we'll get to in the Gemara, for Truma, more specific. So Rabbi Yechon ben Zakkai taught us that a third degree, I'm sorry, Truma and Holon, not only Truma, I'm sorry. Scratch that, let's make it clear. Rabbi Yechon ben Zakkai taught his students, as is the law, that third degree impurity is impure, period. Now, Rabbi Yechon ben Zakkai said, I don't have a verse to back up this notion. I derive it from a a fortiori, how much of the more so. The Gemara will tell us what the, what the how much of the more so is. How Rabbi Yechon ben Zakkai concluded that a third degree impurity is indeed impure, meaning vessel one, food number two, and the next item number three. But Rabbi Yechim Zakkai said, I know that my a fortiori isn't strong enough. And there's going to come a generation that's going to refute my argument and going to say third degree impurity is a non-existent factor because there's no verse. And all I'm using is logic. And sometime in later generation, they're going to refute my logic. This is what Rabbi Yechim Zakkai said. So Rabbi Yeshua is saying, who would uncover the earth from your eyes, Rabbi Yechim Zakkai, if you would be so lucky to hear your student quote a verse? Right? And became your student, maybe like Mikram Atayra, he quoted a verse from the Torah, Shutame, that it is indeed imp uh, impure. Shinema, as the verse reads, anything that's inside becomes actionably impure, not just technically impure, but actionably impure, thus could confirm purity on another. So there's a little bit of like halachic history going on here, where like all these players are, are, are speaking and we think we kind of get into the, not just the technical dry law, but to the back and forth of how this laws were derived and how they discussed and how they, how they felt and thought about these, these teachings. Yeah. Uh, the, the principle here is the fact that there's an extra letter in the word. Oh, okay. It's a very simple principle, right? You have an extra word. You have an extra letter of the word, which changed the word from Tome to Yitma. From a description to an to, to an actionable item. Okay, so God willing, tomorrow we're going to continue, and we're going to learn more more laws, and then I got a teachings that were derived on this day, on this famous day. I find it interesting that uh, Robert Kamara shares the Russian colors. <laughs> okay, wonderful day. Eden. All the very best, you Rabbi Yeshikoa. I'm sorry for my um, lateness today, but I was.